Amy, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no, I'm really excited to have the conversation because we talked to a lot of founders who are building and scaling remote teams, um, but you actually have the opportunity to kind of speak to multiple angles here. You're building something that's highly valuable for remote companies, and then you also kind of have uh, a mix or hybrid model going on at your own, at your own company. So it's, it's like a double whammy here. I'm excited. It is. <laughs> no, it, it, it's a space I'm super excited about. I mean, that is where the workforce of today is going, is to allow for more remote work. We have seen it within our own team where my co-founder, Sarah, actually, uh, she works remote four days a week. Uh, and what's happened is that, you know, we've got, she had her first child in March and she used to come in every day and we would do that. Um, and suddenly with drop off pickup, her commute went from, because she could commute in really early, it suddenly became 90 minutes each way. And so wow. she was losing a lot of hours on both ends of the day. And so we moved to her working remote more where she could sleep more, see her child more and work more. I'm like, this makes a lot more sense. I don't really care if you're in a car. That doesn't make a lot of sense to us. But we're not alone in that. I've seen so many companies move to allowing for more of that flexibility to allow for different types of people to join their organization, to be able to get really interesting people on their team. Um, that's the way things are moving, which is just super exciting to us. Definitely. Definitely. And so what I'd love to do just for anybody who's listening, uh, I'd love to give them a little bit more context about, you know, you're located in Boston, your team's located for the most part in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you make it over to the East coast and yeah, just give us sure. kind of the, the high points of your journey? Cause you've had quite a, quite a mixed background, uh, yeah. leading companies. So I'd love to hear That's more about that. True. So I'm from Northern California, uh, about five and a half hours north of San Francisco. And I ended up on the East Coast because I went to college in upstate New York. So kind of made my way out here, then followed my college roommate into Boston uh, because I was basically looking at, all right, I, I don't want to drive, which limits the number of cities in the US I can live in. And Boston was a really good fit for me. It's smaller. You can have like, you can have a decent life, uh, quality of life versus like being super poor in New York, which didn't seem exciting to me in college. <laughs> uh, and so kind of made that move out here and then have just spent the last uh, 20 years, uh, mostly in tech companies. So really after business school is where I, I kind of spent, I've been in tech since then, but really kind of making my way out here um, and then really focusing my career here because it's just, it's a great city and, you know, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. There's just a lot of fun tap happening in the city right now too, just in the tech space. Mm -hmm. I think as you have more of these companies uh, reaching an exit or, or hitting an IPO, like you see right. this redistribution of investment to the community and a lot of fun things happening. Yeah, you do. Um, for sure. So you, you've had a lot of experience on like the COO and the CFO side, mainly for venture backed companies. So I'd love to hear more just about your experience there and maybe how some of that set you up for what you're doing now with comp. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, for a long time, I was kind of in that finance and operations role, which was really exciting because you get to have access to all the numbers, you know what's going on in a company from you get early indicators, but then you're also managing the workforce where it's like, okay, we know what we've got for funding, we want to scale, how do we deploy that? And it's always around your team. So being able to see both sides was really fun and interesting for me. Uh, and so I did that for several different companies coming in either to scale to the next round or through an exit or whatever the, the case may be. Uh, really, the, that did set me up for what we're doing at Compt. It came out of that experience where one of my companies, we scaled from about 100 people to about 650 over the this time I was there. I was about six years there. Uh, and we were in you know 40 states, 12 countries. The management team was in multiple states. Like we were very dispersed. And I watched how difficult it was to keep a consistent culture across the company and to maintain consistent benefits because we were in all these different places and saw, you know, the pattern repeat from that company to the next two or three where it's like, okay, the candidates walk in the door knowing what salary range they should make. If you don't pay it, they go up the street. And so it's about how else are you attracting the right folks? So what are you adding? How are you selling your culture to them or explaining your culture to them? And what other benefits are you offering them? Uh, and it was all vendor management. So I did what all the other companies did and my teams did. And, you know, we brought in, you know, the espresso machine and the kombucha on tap and the yoga in the office and the manicures and the, you know, all of the things and had a mess. In, in the last like three companies, I'm like, we don't have a choice but to do this because we need to offer these things because people are expecting it, but it's an administrative mess and it actually makes people less happy the more you bring in. And so I basically Googled 
for comp to exist. And since it didn't, I was like, all right, we're gonna go build it. Like this thing has to exist just because the market needs this to be able to, to really grow and scale teams and companies. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so that's tremendous growth, right? A hundred to, would you say 650 employees? Yeah, it was a tech and our uh, services, tech enabled services company. So it was in the kind of health tech space. So a lot of people. Wow. That's incredible. So yeah. So just, I want to pause there for a second because yeah, that, sure. that's an experience that most people probably will never have. Right. Um, and definitely not at that scale. So right. what are some of the, the ways that I guess the negatives, some of the negative outcomes that you've seen come from scaling that quickly? Sure. And what are some of the, the things that people should think about avoiding <laughs> if they sure. find themselves in that position? Some of it was the time period we scaled. So we scaled from 2008 until I think it was there until 2014 was the time period I was there. So it was a unique time kind of in hiring space in time, you know, we were going through a depression through part of that or a recession as a, com- a country. Uh, and because it was, it was, a um, uh, so we trained professional athletes, then we had personal trainers and we put them on site at all kinds of uh, corporations and built out really high tech, fancy gyms. So we were on every Google campus, for instance. So you had a unique population as well. That was not office workers. These were, you know, people who were trained in sports medicine and those types of things. So you had a unique population in a lot of places who aren't even on a computer most of the time. Uh, and we were a very technology light company. So if you are going to scale that quickly into that many places for most companies, you have to have the right technology in place. So that was, there were a lot of growing pains around the fact that putting in a wiki was rocket science there. Like it was very <laughs> difficult to get folks to even log into it to find out the information because you got to figure out how you're communicating with your whole team. And so that was a real challenge. I think there's so many better tools now. I mean, Slack didn't exist when we were so distributed. And that's an amazing tool um, for folks to be able to collaborate and to really stay abreast of what's going on in a company. So being able to have the right tools in place is really important as you start scaling and growing um, with that many folks. Definitely. And it's funny because, you know, obviously we're, we're speaking uh, mainly to founders who are scaling and, and building their own remote teams. But I've had another guest on the show who uh, I believe is Jordan Husney, and he was saying, you know, back in his management consulting days, he'd yeah. be speaking with executives and saying, oh, uh, you know, so tell me about your calendar today. Like, who are, you, right. who are you speaking to? And it was somebody over in California, somebody in Boston, it was somebody in Europe. It was yeah. like, oh, so you're distributed. Right. <laughs> was, exactly. Yeah, I guess we are, technically. Yeah. No, um, that's the thing. Like, even we're seeing even small companies now are being pulled internationally. Like, you can be a less than hundred person company, be U.S. based, and have folks that are on your team in other countries and certainly around the country. So it's not like this is a Fortune 500 problem. This starts very early in a company's life cycle now, uh, where you have to start really thinking and planning for how you're going to be distributed or have just remote workers as well. Definitely. Okay, so. Tons of scaling, uh, obviously lots of, you know, potential pitfalls and going that quickly over that period of time. But what's wrong with kombucha? What's wrong with uh, <laughs> yoga? You know, that sounds good Nothing. to me. Nothing. It's all good or, stuff, like, right? It is. It actually is all good stuff. I mean, and, and my favorite example, because I do think it's a really good benefit, is student loan forgiveness. We've mm-hmm. got a lot of debt in this country. We've got a lot of people who are saddled with that debt. It's a fantastic benefit for the team. The challenge is that... Everything you bring in, you get maybe 10% of the team to use it. So think about what portion of your population would even be eligible to use student loan forgiveness. And then you have to look at how that's administered. So most student loan forgiveness providers, they're backed by a bank. You have to refinance your loan with the bank. So you've already ruled out people who are like, ah, too many steps. Uh, And it can only be for your debt. So it can't be for your kid's debt. It can't be for, you know, your nephew's debt if you want to pay for it, whatever it is. It's very... Um, there's a very specific use case. So the number of people it can impact, it's smaller, smaller, smaller. So even though it's an amazing benefit, it doesn't hit the entire team. Same with kombucha and yoga and everything else. You bring all this stuff in, it's a nightmare to manage because it's all just straight. Like you've got somebody in HR now being like, okay, yoga on Tuesday, making sure you've coordinated that and is the room booked and the whatever. And they become more like admin staff rather than HR. And at the same time, what portion of the team really wants that? And if they're not engaging with it, if you're only getting that 10% per benefit, they're not going to be retained because of it. Because if they don't use it, they don't care. And so right. it, 
you hit this critical mass as well, where it's like, oh my God, too many things. I'm checking out of all of them. And you see this in large organizations that have, you know, the wiki page of all the things they've negotiated. The challenge is that it's too much noise and employees will just check out entirely, which again, goes counter to what you're trying to do to begin with, which is retain the, that top talent. So we approach it differently than that because we think that the engagement piece is, is critical. Otherwise you're wasting your money. Well, yeah, it's funny. I mean, you think about the other decisions a business owner has to make and, you know, you think about investing, like you would not give everybody on your staff a Mac pro rig with video editing capabilities and only two people right. on your team are going to use it. Exactly. It's just everybody else exactly. Us. But we treat well, benefits differently. We treat, them, we treat them differently because we haven't had another choice, but it's also what's been interesting is that you may be making 10% of the team happy. You're making 90% of them unhappy because they're seeing their compensation walk out the door because it really is their compensation where they can't use it. I was talking to a company uh, yesterday that was, you know, about 2000 employees and they were saying, Hey, everybody, every single year has access to $10,000 a year if they want to go and get an advanced degree. And it was like, well, are you folks taking advantage of that? And they're like, no, I already have my degrees. I'm like, so that's $10,000 a year of your compensation you don't get access to. Wow. That's, that's got to be a little frustrating. And so yeah. that's the thing is that there's a way to do this where you can broaden that base of benefits while still allowing employees to really control what things mean for themselves. So it's really trying to get back to really supporting your team in a way that they as each individual would like to be supported. Sure. So I want to, I want to be the one asking the stupid questions. Uh, sure. But why can't, why can't we just give people a stipend? Like why can't yeah. we just pay them a little extra in cash? Why not do that? I mean, we can, and some companies do. Uh, the challenge is a couple of things. So one, uh, you've got, nobody sees their pay stubs. When was the last time you actually saw your pay stub? Like it's <laughs> in the, like no joke, right? Like yeah, you true. probably, maybe when you get your W2, you might go and double check something, but you literally don't see your pay stubs anymore. It's somewhere out there on the internet. And if you feel like you were shorted something, you'll go check it, but it's invisible. And we're not talking about, most companies are not doing $10,000 a year. Let's be clear. Most folks are doing a hundred, two hundred dollars a month to where after taxes, you're literally not even going to feel it. So it just kind of goes into your comp. It goes into your bank account. You pay bills, you pay your rent, you do whatever. It doesn't feel like your company is actually supporting you in something that's saying, Hey, you don't get this unless you engage. And you're like, Oh, I can go get a career coach. Maybe that's what I'm going to do. Or maybe I'll put it towards a class I find that's interesting. Or maybe I will put it towards my debt. It's that it's a different behavioral reaction. Um, so Google actually did a huge AB test on their team. One side they get, which is no surprise, Google loves their data, right? right? Which is awesome. And they published it, which is even better for the rest of us, uh, where they gave part of the team the extra cash and they give part of the team uh, they give them the experiences and the ability to kind of choose things. And they found that the group that got the experiences and was able to choose were far better retained than the group that got the cash. It's just a different psychological benefit. Um, yeah. And so you, it goes much further to be able to support a team, but in an individualized way is the key portion to that. Definitely. Definitely. And that's, I mean, to kind of synthesize some of what we're seeing just in distributed work in general, it's mm -hmm. like, this idea of autonomy is a really yeah. important value for people that are working right and for the future of work. So you're giving even just another level of autonomy for people to right. allocate these funds for what matters to them. It's really cool. Well, and what's so strange is that, I mean, so I've been watching kind of the evolution of the interaction between companies, and employees, at least in my career where, you know, when I started, you know, there was one, it was very formal. You couldn't wear jeans to work, which is amazing uh, that that was even a thing at the time. Uh, but it was, here's your salary. You might get health insurance, sit there, do you're lucky to have a job. You should be so yeah. thankful you have a job. And it was very authoritarian. Uh, and then we moved into this space. We kind of, the pendulum swung the other way where it's like, we really want to support our team. So it became people ops and HR being like, how do we support people? But it felt very paternalistic where it's, hmm. I think this is what you need and I'm going to give it to you. And it became around rewards. Like I'm rewarding you. And it really felt parental. And now I think we're starting to see the swing kind of more towards the middle where it's like, okay, we're literally all adults here. We're all <laughs> equals. So yeah. why would you be deciding what my family needs when our families are very different? Well, tell me what the budget is. Tell me how you want me to focus, but let me do what matters to me instead of you trying to read my mind, which doesn't scale. And really 
like we can do this in a way that can benefit everyone. That's yeah, that is spot on. And um, it, it's funny to see, like, why does it take this long for us to evolve into the, like, what are the other factors yeah. that, that are like holding yeah. us back? But it's, well, I think, yeah. I mean, part of it is that nobody's invested in HR and finance software. So I think like, as an HR and finance person, like we're always the last team to get the cool stuff. So there has been so much money that's gone into MarTech and there's amazing things that have happened there, right. you know, in sales or in product or in engineering has like the best tools. Finance and HR hasn't gotten cool tools. So it's finally starting to, you know, you see a lot more stuff coming out now. You know, you see, you look at like Greenhouse, um, which is an amazing product, Bamboo HR. Like there's some really cool tools that are out there now in different parts of the space. Um, but there hasn't been anything around this space yet, which is what, you know, we're trying to kind of create and build. And who would have thought that taking care of your people would be oh. such an important thing. Yeah. I mean, shocking, right? It's only 85% of your costs in a company are literally your people. So maybe you protect like your team and really think about them and focus on them. Totally. Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of the problem that you're solving at Compt is particularly pronounced for remote companies because you can't yes. buy the espresso machine. You can't buy Correct. the thing that's centrally, you know, co left your co-located right. space. So what are some of the ways that maybe some of your, your clients who are distributed teams have taken advantage of, of the program? Sure. What are some of the creative ways that they're, that they're yeah. offering these benefits? Yeah, they, I mean, so when I was at that company that we scaled from 100 to 650, I was in the Boston office. There were like three of us, whereas the main headquarters was in Phoenix and there were a couple hundred there. So I was on all those conference calls where it's like, hey, we brought lunch in and they're all eating and you're sitting there going, well, with the time zone difference, it's now three o'clock in my time zone and I didn't get free lunch. And this is really unenjoyable. Like, I don't feel like I'm part of the team. I feel like I'm an afterthought, which is what a lot of remote workers feel like. It's like, okay, cool stuff at headquarters or the main office. And you're the afterthought that's like, oh, you should just be glad we let you work remotely in your house that you have outfitted yourself and paying for your own Wi-Fi and doing right. tech support. Like, okay, there's actually a lot of work that goes into being a remote yeah. employee. Uh, so we work with... Um, a lot of companies uh, that have remote populations. One of them uh, is a company called Webflow out in California. They're 70% remote. So they have a very distributed team and they were trying to figure out, all right, how do we, how do we create a consistent culture across and make sure that everyone is equally supported? So what they did was they originally had a, a gym uh, kind of stipend that they had rolled out to folks. So really low utilization because no surprise, not everybody wants to go to the same gym and not everybody right. wants to go to the gym at all. Uh, right. So they kind of got rid of that, rolled out Compt. And what we saw was in the first month, there were 22 different gyms. There were over 300 different offerings that people decided that they wanted to use ranging from getting hiking boots to bar classes to, you know, healthy meals delivered. Like it really ran the gamut. Mm. And it happened immediately. And so what you can see is there's zero chance HR could create a program like that and manage it. It was much, and this was seamless. HR's time being spent was reduced while you still broaden the space of benefits. And that was just in health and wellness. They've added other categories as well to where now you really can see you can expand the base of benefits and really allow that choice. But at the same time, you're still managing to a budget and kind of managing the internal team as well. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, one thing that we, we discuss frequently, you know, on this show is just about kind of the nature of culture in a remote mm -hmm. setting. And I think you alluded to it already by, you know, avoiding, you, you want to avoid making people feel like second class citizens and like not right. a part, especially in a yeah. hybrid model where you're not all on level playing ground. Um, and yeah. perks are obviously like, they're helpful. They're going to make people feel valued. If people take advantage of them in the first place, that's half the battle. Mm -hmm. But I guess, how have you watched some of these teams use that tool of perks to right. build this culture and they're in a distributed setting? Like, cause you have a really yeah. unique advantage, right? You're yeah. seeing, you're doing it yourself. So I'd love to right. hear just personally, your own experience, right. but even just on your clients, just kind yeah. of observing them from the outside. No, and what's cool to see is that a lot of them have cultural values that they really want to double down on and instill and create some consistency across the team. So whether it's, you know, we really want our team to be healthy and that may mean, you know, body, mind, financially, like really looking at the well-being of our team. That is really important to us and that's part of our cultures to support that. 
with a remote employee, that means allowing them to determine for themselves, not like the gym on site. It's okay, maybe for you, if you're working from home, you're probably not getting a lot of movement. It's allowing you to determine what you know, going out and working out looks like, or moving, or, you know, whatever it is, uh, or being able to support your family in a different way. Maybe it's getting a babysitter for the night, uh, so you can get some time away, or, you know, some, allowing you to send flowers to your, your partner because, you know, you're sitting in the house all day making them crazy. You know, whatever it is, it allows them to really still focus and still be part of the same cultural uh, initiatives, but in a way that can be uniquely beneficial to them for somebody who's not sitting in an office where somebody's walking by saying, hey, cupcakes in the kitchen or whatever it is. Um, so it allows you to kind of craft that. We do see a lot of companies using this as a way to say, hey, why don't you just soup up your home office? So we've got some folks that only do a stipend for their remote team or they do a different stipend for their remote hmm. team. So you may have a smaller budget for the team at headquarters because there's a lot of stuff already happening and then a larger budget for the remote folks so that they can get the better monitor, the better mouse, maybe a better chair, uh, maybe some home gym equipment uh, so that they are you know, still moving and having access to that, whatever it is, but allowing the remote folks to maybe even have a bigger budget um, to try and bring them in parity. For sure. So that, so as a, you know, from an employee standpoint, this is a home run, right? Having that autonomy, the flexibility right. to, to nail right. down what actually matters to me. Let's talk about it more selfishly on the business sure. owner side. Like sure. why, you know, we talked about competition and attracting talent, mm -hmm. but talk to me about the other benefits too, of just, you know, offering this to your, to your team and like, sure. there's some natural things, but I don't want to be presumptuous. Sure. Like what have you, what's the sure. benefit to the business owner? Uh, so there's, a, there's a couple. One, it can be a lot cheaper. Uh, so from a cost perspective, this is a lot less expensive way to offer a lot of benefits to your team because what happens right now is a lot of waste. You bring in something, most of these things that you're going to bring in, whether it's yoga or whatever, uh, there's a cost per head uh, that you're paying regardless of whether or not anybody uses it. And so with low utilization and you, you've got a lot of waste happening with this, you can take all that budget and then allow them to increase instead of just doing the one thing. So in the Webflow example, they had their entire budget around one gym. And then they took that same exact budget, but now had hundreds and hundreds of potential offerings for folks. So literally every single person could do something different every single month. So you're allowing them to have a much broader base of benefits, which is great for attracting talent, uh, great for retaining talent without any of the administrative stuff. The other piece hmm. is that, it really is a tool, and this was one of the things that was really important to me as I thought about how we'd build this. Uh, there's not a lot of tools that can help you diversify your team. There's a lot of you know, ways to look about diversity and inclusion. There's certainly a huge conversation that's been happening for quite a while around this, but there's not an actual software tool that's gonna say, hey, this is something that can help you change up the dynamics in your team. And I saw it in most of my companies. I mean, there were tech companies, largely uh, homogenous. So you typically 80 plus percent male, almost all white, uh, you know, sitting in Boston, that's what the demographics look like. And I realized we were creating this self-fulfilling prophecy because it would be a couple of early stage founders that looked and were very much the same stage of life, same education background, same everything. And then you start paying for things that make them happy. And then you attract more people just like them. And it becomes like you get to a point where, of course, you're not spending money on people you don't have. That doesn't make a lot of sense from a financial perspective. But you're going to keep doing this self-fulfilling prophecy where it's like, well, we can't get rid of that or we can't, you know, we have to keep offering, you know, the beer fridge and spending all of our money on beer when you're like, okay, but you're going to keep attracting only people who like beer. Like, think about the other folks that may want to join the team and be really excited about your product. You're building a culture around this one thing. Uh, and so this is a way to break that apart, where you can now say, hey, look, you may still have beer in the fridge, like not anti-beer, but it's a way to say, look, instead of offering this singular, you know, kind of thing that, you know, if it's a gold's gym, you're going to get a very particular person. If that's your only benefit, very certain type of person who is going to want to go work out at Gold's Gym with their coworkers. Instead of doing something like that, you offer this broader base. It can attract people who live in different locations, who are in different stages of life, who have kind of different perspectives on things. So it's really a tool to help you broaden the talent pool as well. 
Wow. Yeah. My mind is blown. It's, it's so funny because it's like that whole self-fulfilling prophecy. It's not like anybody sets out to do that. No, in some they nefarious don't. I don't think, plan. Totally. Right. Like, I don't think that was the case in any of the situations I've been in where it was like, Hey, we're going to build a really homogenous company. We think that's a great idea. No <laughs> one said that, but it's, it becomes this, you know, this prophecy. And some of it, I think there's some great software out there that's trying to break apart, you know, the, the recruiting stage and change that up. But even if you can get those people in the door and diverse from your team in whatever way, if you're not supporting them, they're not going to stay. So you have to be able to manage how this is going to look within your company, because even if you can attract those folks or get them to start interviewing, if they walk in and they're like, okay, this is not an environment that is conducive to, to me working here. Um, so you need to be able to break that apart. Yeah. I guess to that point too, like this isn't a leading question, but have you observed or haven't you observed, are, are people more open about sharing how they spend that stipend? Does that become kind of a point of sharing amongst uh, a community or amongst, amongst a team? It is. It's been really interesting. So one of our very early uh, customers, uh, they were one of our betas actually, tested this out within their own team. So it was a benefit broker in Boston who originally had, you know, they had something that was like fill out an HRA, so like a health risk assessment survey, and you get $300. You get $300 cash, just fill out the survey. So they poked and poked and poked their team, just fill it out, we'll give you the cash. Here you go, cash, fill out the thing. 9% of the team filled out the survey. Nobody did it. They put this in place. They're only doing $50 a quarter. So they're actually offering less cash to the team and 100% utilization within like a month and a half. And they've stayed sustained around the 80% marker because what they see is, you know, Jim got a really cool pair of running shoes and wow, that's really interesting. And then you start seeing, like, I can see, I can follow the receipts, right? It's like Jim got running shoes and then four other people on the team did. And then suddenly they'd started a running club together, which is super cool. And then you just start seeing as people start sharing that information with each other that, um, it builds this internal community. Um, another one of our early, uh, customers, they put this in place. They were just starting it to think about perks. Within the first month, there was somebody on the sales team uh, who had gone and uh, taken uh, an engineering class. Like they thought that was interesting. They wanted to learn more about that. There was somebody on the engineering team who had bought books about leadership training because they wanted to go more the management route. And there was somebody else who was on the marketing team who uh, went and bought a bunch of gift cards and handed them food gift cards and handed them out to the homeless. Like that's amazing to see that type of a culture that enables that but it's also not something that hr could ever from a top-down perspective be like hey we now are going to give out food gift cards to the homeless and that's going to be our only perk that's that's not something that's going to happen in a really authentic and organic kind of way whereas when you start seeing the team do these things on their own it becomes more it, it becomes a culture reinforcer which is really cool to see yeah, I like that idea of cultural reinforcer because we've observed this even on our own team in a very simple way. Um, we have a channel dedicated to travel, right? So we're 100% remote. That means yeah. a lot of our team is traveling all the time. And so people will post there. They'll post, you know, beautiful yeah. sunsets in Thailand or wherever they are, right? Totally. And it becomes a doorway into understanding yeah. that person more. It's like, oh, what, you're really into uh, to different types of yeah. foods. Like, tell me more about that. You know, so it's like you can't ever manufacture culture in my opinion you can try right. to like create totally. environments and what you're explaining just sounds like you're creating these open doors for people to get to know each other yeah. you know in a way that's really substantial and totally well and i mean we've, i've had a lot of conversations with folks who have the remote team piece and they're like well how do you i mean when you start working next to each other like physically next to each other you're going to pick up on jokes and you're going to learn more about each other how do you do that when you're remote and that's where i actually think slack is a genius genius program or um, software product where you know putting a funny little gif in or posting a picture of where you were traveling to or whatever it gives a little glimpse into who you are and allows people to kind of interact with that in a really authentic and cool way uh, without being in the same physical space uh, and that's where I think things like that are really important for building kind of this this team aspect um, so it's it's pretty cool yeah. So, all right. So I speak to a lot of founders. We work with a lot of founders. I think you are probably one of the founders who has the most experience before starting <laughs> her own company. Yeah. Like seriously, really impressive <laughs> fact record. People will get Thank more you. of it in the intro. Um, 
I don't say that just to flatter you, but I say it to, to preempt what I'm asking next, which is we love to talk about kind of the future of work, right? So yeah. I won't hold you to any okay. prophecies <laughs> or predictions, but um, you know, you guys are really tapping into, I think, one area of the future of mm-hmm. work that's just, it's, it truly is disruptive in, in the sense of the word is that there's nothing out there doing what you're doing. Right. But what are some of the other trends that you're seeing? Um, and yeah. don't feel pressured to think about it just sure. in the sense of remote work, but just yep. broad sweeping trends, cultural values, whatever it might be, just yeah. let me have it. Yeah, and so I think a lot about the compensation space, obviously. Uh, I think where we're headed uh, there in particular uh, is moving more towards uh, a complete salary transparency and compensation transparency and what will end up happening. Like that's where I see the laws moving uh, and it's a way to manage and make sure that companies aren't discriminating. Like there's a lot of good stuff that comes with that. Uh, It also means though that there, I think there's going to be a time and a place where we have a lot more levers on our own compensation. So we're one kind of tiny slice of a compensation pie, if you will. Uh, So about 30% of our compensation these days across the entire U.S., across industries is non-salary, non-bonus, which is a huge percentage of your compensation that is coming through something you don't get to negotiate or control. That's crazy. Where I think we're moving to is companies being like, all right, my all-in, what I'm willing to have, you know, to pay for, for this level of employee in this location is... Uh, and make up a number of fifty thousand uh, dollars, and so maybe they want to put dials on. You know, we don't want you to have no base, but we don't want it to go and be fully fifty thousand either. So maybe there's some highs and lows on that. Maybe there's a bonus or a variable component that the employee can play with. Maybe it's PTO they can play with. Maybe they don't need the health insurance of the company because they're on their spouses. But allowing employees to really move the knobs on the dial for their own personal situation is is where I think things are going. I don't think it's going to be too, too fast because that's a massive overhaul. But I do think that some of the really cutting edge companies are going to be playing with that sooner rather than later um, as a way Mm -hmm. to really allow for that individualization because I do think that's where we're headed. Yeah. And I feel like you hit on something really key too earlier when you were speaking, just about how, you know, some of these rewards or perks, they're also extending to the family, right? Yeah. So it's not static. It's not just for right. the employee. And so that, that has got to impact retention too and got to make people Absolutely. feel cared for Absolutely. just beyond the paycheck. And it's cared for, but in a way that I get to determine, like, I don't want somebody to, you know, take care of me. I want to have access and determine how, in my life, this is going to be an important thing for my company to support for me. Uh, so whether that's, you know, paying for like, maybe, maybe you don't have student loan debt, but maybe your partner does. And so that's still a household expense. That's still something that's really important right now with the student loan forgiveness providers that are out there that companies offer, it can only be your debt. So you couldn't even use that benefit for a partner. So being able to expand that to each employee's situation and letting them control that, I think is super important. Definitely. I love that. So I I know a lot of folks that are going to be listening or watching this are probably in a self-funded situation. They bootstrap their company um, and they desperately want to invest in their people. But mm-hmm. cash flow is a real concern. So what would you say to somebody who wants to invest in their people, wants to do right yep. by them, but feels like they are starting with too little or not sure yeah. when enough is enough, right, to start a right. program like this? Well, and I think that, I mean, so we work with companies of all sizes. We find that once you've hit 20, 25 employees is where you really start hitting the tipping point below that. It doesn't matter. We have one customer that was one of our alphas that was offering five grand a year even though they were 12 people for Mm -hmm. continuous learning. Nobody used it. They all felt guilty because it was founder money and they didn't feel like they could do that. We find that once you hit that 20 or 25 people, it really starts changing things. But we find that a lot of companies will start with things that seem really cool at the time. Mm -hmm. Food is a big one where they'll be like, you know what, lunch for 15, 20 people that's not that expensive. It's not going to decide if we make it to our next round or not. So we're going to start doing that. We're just going to buy lunch every single day. Another one of our customers had started out that way. And when they hit 130 people, they were spending $15,000 a week on food and they couldn't afford any other benefits. And like, whoa, whoa. Okay. So food's not going to retain my team. 
that's a lot of money and we really need to offer other benefits. How do we do this? So what they did was they took that same budget, put it on comps, had a food category. So if lunch is the most important thing to you, you can still go get lunch on the company. But if you really don't care about lunch and would prefer to have student loan forgiveness or health and wellness or continuous learning, you can use that budget for something that matters to you. So it scales in a better way. So it's thinking about what's going to scale for your company. Those early stage companies start out small. Like we've got some of those smaller companies that do 50 bucks a quarter and get great utilization. It doesn't take a lot right. of cash to be able to support your team. That's awesome. That's, and it's really encouraging too. Is it's what I'm hearing from you is just, just start just because yeah. you're kind of making a commitment and you're saying, Hey, we want to continue investing and we know right. this isn't huge, but right. this is a token of, of us thinking of you and wanting you to have the autonomy and be an adult and, right. <laughs> and find something helpful. Yeah, right. Exactly. Without having to be like, Oh, well, I mean, so when you're a small team, it's like, we can afford one thing. What's the one thing that's going to make everyone happy. There's literally not a one thing that doesn't exist. So you're going to make a bunch of people unhappy. And if you're 20 people and you only make 10% of the team happy, it's two people. Like right. that's not too exciting. So it's like, all right, well, can't win for losing. So this isn't right. going to work out so well. So it's, it's how do you do that in a scalable way? You can always scale funds up. You can always scale in all kinds of ways, but it's, you know, decide what your culture is and then have the tools around you support it rather than trying to make perks your culture. Awesome. Well, I love what you guys are building. It's just, I think you're, you're not only uh, having an impact on the, you know, founders and their teams, but also their families and their partners and just by extension, mm -hmm. so many people that you're impacting through, through this tool and this program. So uh, I applaud what you're doing. We'll be cheering you on, I think uh, for a long time here. Um, with that said, how can people reach out to you if they want to hear more about comps or, uh, or anything else? Sure. So our website is uh, compt.io, C-O-M-P-T.io, and they can always reach out to me, Amy, at compt.io as well. So uh, happy awesome. to chat with anyone. Great. Thanks so much, Amy. Thanks so much for your time. You bet.